Good evening, East Auburn. I'm quite impressed with those of you who made the uh, trek through the storm to get here tonight to be together with other believers. And we definitely are a right side or my left side church, huh? Um, Saturday night just happens to be my favorite service. Don't tell the other services that this is my favorite night, but this is my night, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. My name is Amy Worry. I am the care coordinator here on staff. And if you have any questions or needs that come up um, during this time, I'm usually here just hanging around, so feel free to reach out to me. Let's join in for worship. If you would stand with us, we're going to be doing a couple of Christmas songs this evening. Uh, you know, this is the Advent season, and one of the things that we're told in Isaiah was that uh, one of the signs that would be uh, present is, is that he would be given the name Emmanuel, God with us. And he is with us tonight. Amen? Amen. And so we want to celebrate that as the angels celebrated it when he was born, singing Gloria in Excelsis Deo. <laughs> Be safe for me.
Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Doyle, and I'm an elder here at East Auburn. Um, we have a number of people we're praying for. Um, I know this is a small service, but I've been in smaller, just in smaller spaces. Um, so uh, why, don't, why don't we pray? Uh, there's a number of people specifically we're praying for. God, I thank you for um, everyone that's able to be here tonight. God, we pray that uh, everyone would be safe out on the roads. Lord, we pray for um, we pray for our, our plow crew and, and people that help to maintain. God, we pray that uh, you would keep power on in homes, that people would be warm. And um, Lord, we pray for the people that weren't able to make it here or maybe tried to make it here. And um, God, for our, our families. Um, Lord, we pray for our church family. Um, we have a number of people that we're praying for, specifically for the Lieva family, Lord, uh, Jose's mother passed away, and so we just pray for him and his family, that you comfort them, that um, you give them peace, and uh, Lord, for a number of our church family that are struggling with cancer, we, know, we have uh, Roberta Burgess is starting chemo this week, we pray that you would strengthen her body, that the treatment would be effective, and um, Lord, that you would just... Um, surround her with people, make her a light um, within the hospital. And God, we, we thank you that in our struggles, our difficult times, that we're not alone, that you're with us. God, that we can um, always hear from you, depend on you. Um, Lord, we pray for the service here tonight for Tim as he uh, opens your word and shares it with us. God, we pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would lead and guide him, that um, you would use his words, your word, to uh, work effectively in our lives. And God, we just thank you that we can gather here together, that we can still worship you. We thank you for this Christmas season um, and pray that it would be a season that a lot of people um, that might be contemplating, Lord, would be led to Christ, that they would know and understand the message of Christmas. And uh, God, we just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to East Auburn. My name is Anne, and we are so thankful that you could join us this weekend. Here are the ministry updates for the week. And if you are new or joining us online, we would love to hear from you. Please fill out our online connect form. Hope Haven in Lewiston is in need of donated winter coats for men, women, and children. If you are cleaning out your closet and have cold weather gear that is in good condition, please bring it to the donation box in the lobby of the church. Thank you for that. We are so thankful that all of our angel tree tags have been taken. If you picked up a tag last week, please be sure to purchase your Christmas gift, wrap it, and return it to the church on December 12th. Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are on their way around the world, and we collected over 500 shoe boxes here at East Auburn. Thank you, church. If you are looking to learn more about the Bible and grow in your faith, a new semester of Faith Bible Institute will be starting in January. For more information or to enroll, please visit fbiclass.com. If you are new to East Auburn, have questions, or are in need of help, our church office is open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturdays, as well as during service times on Sunday. 
Tithes and offerings can be given online at eabc.me slash give or placed in the boxes as you leave the service. We want to pray with you. If you are in need of prayer, please follow the signs to the prayer room in room 117 after the service. Please wait for an usher to dismiss you at the end of the service. If you are a parent with children in Sunday school, you will be dismissed first to go and pick up your kids. While you wait, please be sure to gather all of your personal belongings. We encourage you to fellowship outside before you leave. Thank you for signing up for church every weekend. Signups are open starting every Sunday afternoon for the following weekend. Thanks for being here today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service. So yeah, you're welcome to worship outside after the service. Go for it. And you may not get an usher to let you out, so you can probably go on your own. Um, and I was noticing the angel tree and the, the shoe boxes. Those all started way back with the junior high, probably 10 or 15 plus years ago. So it's nice to see those things still going. The junior hires were, we used to do those kinds of things all the time, and it's, it's just got picked up by the whole church and keeps going and going. So that's really sweet to see. Just going to get my props here. Um, we've been praying a lot for Janet Brzezowski. She's the lady that had a heart transplant a few months ago. And we had her, her memorial service today. She passed away this week. And just wanted to let you know that if you hadn't heard that, and many, many prayers have gone up. And it was one of the most sweetest services I've ever been to. Um, her daughter spoke and was just so, so uh, articulate and emotional and, and it was very meaningful. So, and Roger knew her so well, I didn't realize. And um, so it was really special for the family, but you can be praying for Richard, her husband, and, and her three kids, but um, she did pass away. Today I want to talk about a topic that um, you and I practice all day, every day, thousands and thousands of times. It's the topic of choices. Did you know that we make about 35,000 choices in a day, according to the researchers? That's 2,000 an hour while we're awake. That's, that's a lot of choices. That's, no wonder we're overwhelmed sometimes if we have that many choices to make. Many of them are pretty small and not very consequential. They're, they're just kind of automatic, like where am I gonna go to get coffee in the morning? I'm not gonna go anywhere, but um, Cumberland Farms for a dollar seven and free on Fridays and um, you know we, we get four different choices there but but we make choices all day every day and some of them are really consequential some of those 35,000 some like our attitude choosing what our attitude is going to be can change everything can it? it can just make such a huge difference with us and our whole home and the people around us um, Right along with the attitude, I think of our words. Can you just imagine all the words we have to choose? How are we going to say this? Are we going to say this or not? Um, James chapter 3 reminds us that words can do a lot of good or a lot of damage. It talks about uh, the tongue being able to steer a ship, and I just think of it like a steering a situation. You know, you get, you, you get something going on around you. Um, there's an argument, maybe, or conflict, or possible conflict. And, and our words can steer that to either a good place or maybe a bad place. You know, it says our, our words are like fire. We can, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire, which is a really bad thing to do. Don't ever do it. Um, but the, our, our tongue, our words, can do that. We can fan the flames of what's going on. I was witnessing that yesterday as I was p picking out a, a Christmas tree with my family members, and I won't tell who they were, but they were like arguing about this tree, and one of them wanted to shop and look around and check it out and find the right tree. And the other one wanted the first tree, of course, you know? And it wasn't me this time, but I did pass it along really good, just to let you know, to my son. <laughs> But it was, you know, we, we have that choice. How are we going to say it? What are we going to say? Making the right choices isn't always easy either. We can get overwhelmed. We can get pretty confused in making them. Marty and I started a kitchen um, redo about two years ago, a little bit more, and we, we did everything, everything from the floors, ceiling, and all that kind of stuff. There were so many things to choose from. It was really hard, and 
I'm that guy, like I said, first one, you just kind of take it, but that's not always the best one, and my wife is exactly the opposite. So we were so stuck that she went out and hired an interior decorator. And that's like, if you don't, now I can see it, like that was a great idea, but before it was like, why are you going to spend that much? And why can't we, really it was just, why can't we just decide on our own? You know what I mean? It's like colors. We've been married 28 years. We can decide colors, right? We can decide which countertop and all that stuff, but every single decision was like an impasse because she wanted to check it out and make sure it was the perfect one and all that. So finally, we hired this lady, uh, Laurel Libby. Actually, she goes to our church. She's great. She's done some of the things around here that make our building look good, and it was the best choice we ever made. But get this. I started them. I, I asked a math teacher I said, that goes to our church, and I said, can you help me decide or figure out how many decisions we had to make. How many choices did we have in this, this kitchen remodel, OK? You have the floors, like I said. You have the countertops. You have the color of the walls. And what kind of tiles, the color of the tiles, the shape of the tiles, the appliances, on and on. And I said, OK, uh, this is what I think. I, I said, give me the formula. Let's see if we can figure it out. So I gave, she gave me the formula, and I plugged it in. And here's what it came out to. And I used conservative numbers. I didn't go all out and say, you know, there's, there's really thousands of appliances. I only said, well, we'll choose 50 appliances. So this is the number. You ready? 156 trillion, 250 billion choices. That's how many combinations that were conservatively of the things that we had to decide on this kitchen remodel. I felt really good about hiring her after that. I, I don't have any problem with not being able to figure out when I realized it was that many. And she checked my work, too, by the way, as a good teacher would. And um, there's a lot of choices to do. The Bible doesn't offer us a whole lot of guidance on doing a kitchen, but it does in doing life. Today, I want to focus on the metaphor of the cup. That's why I have two cups here today, as it relates to choices. To help us focus, I asked a friend of mine from the church, who's Rob, he's an artist, and I said, Rob, you know, someday I'm going to do this message, and, and it's going to be on Communion Sunday, and I want to have it relate to the cup, and could you just, just paint for me, or draw, or whatever you do on a cup, uh, illustration of what the cup symbolizes in the Bible? He said, sure, I'd love to do that, and that was probably a year and a half or so ago, and here we are in this summer, this wintry, snowy, that's the word I wanted, day, and um, finally the cups are showing up. Um, he had so many choices to make that he was overwhelmed. He, he only did these in the last week. He just gave it to me last Sunday. Um, he did it really simply. White on the outside, black on the inside. Black on the outside, white on the inside. Two simple choices. I like simple, especially after that trillion thing. It's like, I, I like the idea of being clear, it's either that one or that one. In, in life, isn't it kind of that way? That we have a choice of what we're going to do. We're either going to obey, obey, clean inside, or we're not going to obey. There's really no other cup there, is there? If there is, you shout it out, because I'd love to hear it. It's like sometimes we're not sure, and sometimes it's hard to figure it out. But, but really, there's not a cup over here, and we can just say, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to ignore Obeying God, I'm going to ignore disobeying. I'm just going to do this because there is no other one. So we have clarity. We have two cups that we can choose from. Matthew 23, verse 25. Jesus talks about cups. It reminds me of this. It might be the one that Rob was thinking of when he, when he painted them. Matthew 23, 25 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Hmm. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, maybe, of course, some of our day too, were more concerned about how they looked to others and how they looked on the outside than they were with what was going on on the inside. And, of course, Jesus, as he says over and over, he looks at our heart. He knows what's going on, on the inside. He's much more concerned with what's on the inside than what is on the outside that other people see. The most familiar biblical passage I can think of about a cup is in Psalm 23. It's a Psalm of David. We read it often. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness 
for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And, and here it is. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David sings in this psalm about a whole lot of things that are filling his cup, making it overflow, goodness, encouragement, God's leading, God's restoration, God's goodness, God's mercy. And he was so blessed, he, he pictured it like a cup that was overflowing. And, and I don't picture it like a cup just kind of filling over and just slowly, but, you know, like bubbling up, you know, full. It was just it's making a mess everywhere, a good mess. It's just filling up. Cups in the Bible aren't always good, though. Isaiah 51, 17 is a real contrast to this Psalm 23 cup. It says there that, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. It's just the opposite. The first one's like to get a drink of um, the cup, it was just overflowing. You, you didn't have to do anything, just bring it close to your mouth. But then it shows the, this cup, this cup of fury. And what are they doing? It, it kind of the picture of they're drinking it all. They're, they got to empty. It's like, I want more and more. I need more. There's not enough. I'm not getting what I need. I'm not getting what I want. The dregs, it says, the remnants. It wasn't just a taste. <laughs> they kept drinking and drinking. And it's called the cup of fury. Because they were corrupt. They were disobedient over and over again. They were making the wrong choices over and over. And because of that, they were trying to drink from this cup of fury and not being satisfied. Receiving fury from the Lord instead of comfort. There was one evening in Jesus' life, too, where he talks about the cup two times. And that's the evening just before that he was crucified. Jesus uses the cup at the Last Supper, and then he uses it again at Gethsemane as they pray. He goes to Gethsemane with all his disciples, and he takes his close ones, and he, he brings them out to pray. And he's going to talk about that cup. And um, it just illustrates that sometimes drinking that cup is really hard. Even for Jesus, it's really hard. Let's read it. Matthew 26, 36 to 42. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here where I, while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. <laughs> Drinking the cup was hard. He brought his prayer buddies with him. He prayed fervently to the Lord because this was a hard task, a hard choice to make. He knew what it was. He, he had no quavering, I think, or quivering of what he was going to decide because he wanted to decide for us. <laughs> that was sure. But was there another way? Was there another cup, another choice? Then he came to the disciples, and he found them asleep, and he said to Peter, what, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. I love it. At Gethsemane, he chose us. He, he had us in mind, the, the world. He chose to die for the world, and we were in that cup. We were what he valued. He's, we were the ones he was caring for. But despite the cost, he chose us. It's kind of like, he, because he valued obeying the Father over and over, and he said, i got to be about my Father's business, right? That's why I came here. Um, he valued obeying the Father. He valued us. He valued his people, the world. And because he did, that helped him to make the right choices, just this life for us. What we value will help us to decide what we're going to do 
if our family is most important, we're going to make decisions for our family. If our job is, if we are, which is always partly a problem, but for some people it's even more of a problem. It seems like it's all about them, and everything in the whole family and the whole world has to be about them. And of course, that doesn't work very well for anyone. Our values help us decide which cup we are going to drink. Not the ones we think we should have, too. I, I thought of that. Sometimes we get stuck in thinking that, you know, I, I should have the value of obedient, obeying cut. I should have the value of loving my wife always. I should have the value of serving other people. I should have the value of not being lazy or whatever. But, but in reality, if we look at our choices, sometimes that's, they don't add up. It's like, yeah, that's right, you should, but, but <laughs> with our choices, we're spending all our money and time on us. And um, we're drinking from the wrong cup. Earlier that evening, before Gethsemane, before the prayer that we just looked at, was the Last Supper, the Passover meal with the disciples. He mentions the cup at that supper, too. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is giving an account of this. We read it each time we do communion, and we're doing communion tonight. So this is going to go right into that. 1 Corinthians 11.23, For I received from the Lord that which I deliver, also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the cup represented a new covenant, one of salvation for us, not based any longer on animal sacrifices and obeying the law, but based on what Jesus was about to do, the work he did on the cross, the work that he has done for us. And he says here, do this in remembrance. Remember that. Remember that cup I gave you to, that I gave to the disciples, that cup of the new covenant. Don't forget I did it. I think is what he's saying. One aspect of Galilean life that I think makes this even more impactful is the ceremony of the marriage cup. And um, Mark was just sharing with me about this too and just giving me more information that it was the Galilean marriage custom to um, have the person that wants to get, man that wants to get married, the Galilean man, would go with his father to the chosen woman's, his fiance, his bride, or to be, or that he wanted to be anyways, to their house and to negotiate, kind of. They'd negotiate the money or physical items that the woman's father would ask for in exchange for giving up his valuable daughter. So it, this is the father of the groom is giving to the father of the bride, to the family of the bride. And I know that sounds kind of weird and maybe patriarchal, patri what's the word, patriarchal, condescending. But um, think of it this way, is that it's showing the value of the bride more than ever. A lot of times it was the opposite, right? That the woman's family had to give to the grooms. Now to me that sounds really bad. You know, that's, that sounds worse to me. You have to give money. I won't take her unless you give me money. That, that doesn't sound good at all. But in this Galilean culture, it, it's kind of like, it's good. Let me go on here. In the case, in, um, they'd negotiate. And, um, the bride has the final say in this one. That's what I'm trying to say. The bride gets to choose whether or not in the end she's going to get married. It's not her father and somebody else deciding. She gets the end. And so after they discuss it, after they negotiate it, they take the cup and they pour some wine into it. And the father of the groom, he takes it and he gives it to his son. And he says, okay, we got it figured out. I think we've got it, this thing um, decided on. Here you go, take this. And he would take that cup over to his bride-to-be and hand it to her. Okay, so he's giving it to her. She takes it or not. She drinks from it or not. But if she drinks from it, she's saying, yeah, I accept. <laughs> I agree. Let's get married. It's, it's like a done deal right from that moment. It's not a cool picture when you think of Jesus doing that for us. <laughs> he's giving it to us. 
He's handing us the cup. He's, he's saying, I, I choose you. And um, it's your choice. And I really hope you take it. I really hope you drink from it. He chooses us. The son was saying, kind of like, I love you, and I offer you my life. Will you take it? And she has the choice. We have that choice, too, with Jesus. Every time we drink from the communion cup and hear the words, this cup is a new covenant, God, God's kind of saying to us, I love you. I invite you to be my spiritual bride. And every time we drink it, we're saying to him, I accept. I accept your life and I give you my life in return. Isn't it nice to be chosen? Chosen for anything, let alone being a bride. It's like, as kids, you know, you, I can remember that feeling of you're on the side and, and you got to be picked for a teams or for a game or whatever. And um, it was kind of nerve-wracking if you're not the people to get picked first. But when you get picked for things, it's like, oh, man, that's good. I was thinking, too, that we don't have to worry with Jesus, like, if he knows what he's getting into. It's like, he knows what's under our hood, right? It's, it, uh, we're selling a couple of cars or trading cars or something, and, and part of the deal is, do, you, do they know what they're really getting? Or do I know what I'm really getting? Is the transmission slipping? You know, is the, there a tick in there or something that's going to cost me thousands of dollars? But with God, when he looks into us, he knows exactly what he's getting. And he still gives us the cup and offers it to us. He says, yeah, I choose you. I give you my life. Will you give me yours in return? Accepting his cup means that I acknowledge my sin and I need him. That I accept his salvation and I choose to drink from his cup. Well, most of us here, we've been to church before because we wouldn't be here on this wintry night if it wasn't so. But where's the cup? You know, if Jesus gave you the cup, if you've accepted that cup many, many years ago, perhaps, where is it today? Is it front and center on your, of your life? Is it, is it, you know, a clear thing that you, every single day, you make that decision and you say, yeah, I choose life. I choose salvation. I choose the good things that God has for me. Um, or is it a cup that's up in your cupboard, you know, up back behind things and up on the top because you never use it or just kind of hidden away or maybe packed away. No. Front and center. This, it makes it so much easier, doesn't it? One or the other. Helps us make choices, the 35,000 or so that we have in our life. So as we close with communion now, um, I just encourage you to remind yourselves and to be reminded that Jesus chose us. He handed it off. You know, where is it? Are we using it? Are we still drinking from it? You know, it makes this, um, this next slide on obedience, it's like that one, yeah. It's like, okay, am I going to love others or am I just going to love myself, only myself? You know? Okay, here's a choice I have to make, and clearly it's going to cost a little bit. It's going to take a little time. It's going to be effort. It's going to be not so comfortable. Am I going to choose that one because it seems like the right thing? Or am I going to choose this one, love only self? You know, maybe it'll help us make the decision. To have courage, sure, to be defensive, to be, you know, am I going to be courageous or fearful? It'd probably be a better one to have there, courage or fearful. It's a decision we make. It's like, okay, I'm going to act in fearfulness and not dare to talk to that person to do this thing, or am I going to choose courage and obey, humility or fear, serve or be lazy. I encourage you as you take communion that you um, just prayerfully connect with Jesus. We're going to have just three minutes of, of silent prayer. You can talk to your Lord on your own, in your own heart. Use it as a time to think about that cup and where it is in your life. And, and maybe, maybe there's some decisions that you and choices that you are about to make or are making that this helps you. Do it at your own time. Don't wait for me to, to read the scripture again. It, it's right there if you want to hear the scripture or read the scripture yourself as you take it. Um, but at the end of the three minutes, I will pray and, and we'll close.
Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing us. And uh, we know you didn't have to, and you did it out of love. You didn't do it blindly. You knew exactly what you were getting yourself into. So those of us who struggle with that, I pray that you would just touch us with that grace and mercy that you have so that we can accept and understand that you've done that for us. Thank you for offering us the cup. We, we take it, Lord, with joy. We offer our lives back to you. Help us this week as we make choices to drink from your cup, to drink from your salvation over and over again. And, and just as David received the goodness and blessing and peace and provision, Lord, we... Um, Thank you for the way that you provide those for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.